I want to help other people and I want to help other people get into this business because it's a great business and it's wonderful. And there's a lot of opportunity. And if you, if real estate, such a low barrier to entry business, it's kind of the wild west. For in the back of your mind, your dreams should be real, right? And Thanks all for tuning in to Dreamcatchers, where we make things happen. Dreamcatchers was formally launched to unlock the hidden potential in successful, self-motivated individuals who desire to take their life's work to the next level but need support to evolve. We are a collective group of professionals with various backgrounds that use our talents to assist those individuals in realizing their wildest dreams by providing education, inspiration, and direction. This podcast is where we share the lessons we've learned along the way to catching our dreams and give you some context around the how and the why to each approach to put you further ahead on the journey to catching your dream. Are you ready? Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dreamcatchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome. I've got the pleasure of having Brian C. Adams with me today. Brian, how are things out in Knoxville? Nashville. 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 Everything's good, man. I... We're, you know, I don't know when this is going to be released, but we're recording on election day. So a lot going on, but we're doing okay. Yeah. I should make you pull out the crystal ball and tell me what's going to happen tonight. Is it? uh, Yeah, this is worth doing. Who's going to win? Like, are we going to know tonight who won? I'll tell you what's going to happen tonight. I'm going to go home after I put in a day of work, put the kiddos down watch a little bit of coverage with my wife who's going to be freaking out. I'm going to have an adult beverage and I'm going to go to bed around 9 30 to 10 o'clock. That's what's going to happen tonight. (laughs) Beyond that, who the hell knows, man? I think it's going to be prolonged. I think there'll be litigation. I think there'll be a lot of grandstanding. There'll be a lot of prognosticators that are ultimately proved wrong. And there'll be a lot of energy spent talking about what's going to happen over the next two to four weeks, but I think it will take a while to all shake out. Um, That's my prediction. So that sounds like you don't believe we're going to know on election night who the president of the United States will be in 2021. Correct. I agree with you 3000%. So yeah, we'll see. I think I think there'll be a lot of legal bills and a lot of hours built up fighting about this. So it's all insane at the end of the day. So I like to do this at the front. Most podcasters do it at the back. If the listeners want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. That's how we connected. If you want to look me up, Brian C. Adams, Excelsior Capital, drop me a note connect with me. Um, I'm happy to, to talk about anything that I might be able to be helpful about. Um, and then you can go w- visit the website, excelsiorgp.com, sign up to our newsletter, et cetera. Um, but those are probably the two best ways to get in touch with me. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, it's worth it. Reach out to Brian. He's a true giver and he has a ton of value. Can't mean, I mean, not from the bottom of my heart. So Brian, what do you do? Like, what's Excelsior Capital? What What is all this stuff about? And how'd you get there? Because, I mean, you and I were talking about lacrosse and athletes and football one day. And then I found out you were like an attorney at some point. So, <laughs> dirty. Yeah. Um, sure. So, we're a, we're a funless sponsor, right? So, we have a commercial real estate investment platform based in Nashville, started the business 10 years ago. We made a lot of mistakes over the last 10 years um, and have tried to not make them again and again. And what we do is very simplified now. We provide taxable investors, which I delineate from institutional investors who are non-taxable. So that means individuals and families and private wealth management firms that work with taxable investors. We give them access to commercial real estate opportunities that provide a safe place to park capital for a period of years, to provide a good cash on cash yield, some kind of passive income, and that takes advantage of all the tax benefits associated with direct real estate ownership. Those are three things that we do. 
Now it's mostly commercial real estate, but we're not beholden to a certain type of product or, or asset class. And we could be opportunistic, which is why I like being a fundless sponsor. Fundless sponsor, break that down for the listeners. They may not know yeah. fun versus fun, versus fundless, break that yeah. down. Yeah, so a fund would be, I come to you and I say, I've got this great idea. I think we can make some money. Here's the general sketch of the idea. Here's my investment thesis. Here's where I think there's inefficiencies in the market, whatever kind of cliches you want to throw out there. And you say, Brian, that sounds great. It's exciting. I'm going to commit to give you a dollar. And I say, great. And I get you and a hundred other people to commit to give me a dollar. I've got a hundred dollars of capital that I can put to work when I go find opportunities. That's what's called a commingled blind fund where you commit on the front end but you have no transparency to what exactly I'm going to buy. And over the course of three to four years, I put that money to work. I invest that money on your behalf into a portfolio of opportunities and that hopefully make money. It's a good model for certain people. And we can get into that if you want. A fundless sponsor is somebody who I don't have a committed fund. I don't have capital at the ready. I find an opportunity, I source a deal off market, I find a property that I think is attractive, and then I go to my network and I raise money on just that one deal. So an investor would participate in just that specific offering. There'd be no cross collateralization or no other exposure to other deals. It would be just becoming a partner on that one building. And, and that's what I do. So basically, it's more of a transparency thing, blind versus clear line of sight on what they're investing in. And is that different? I'm always curious about this, and I don't think I've ever talked to an expert. So when somebody is investing in like a startup, are they opening a fund? Like a, like a private business, a venture capital, a, a technology startup or something? Yeah. Yeah, so that would just be you know, participating in, in purely that operating company. But like anything, there's certainly venture capital funds and private equity funds that focus on those type of opportunities. And there's pros and cons. It's not like I've got some kind of, you know, golden key that I've unlocked the, the source of all the mystery of the finance universe. It's really a function of my network of investors and my peer group and the people that I've, you know, grown over the last 10 years, they prefer participating on investments on a deal by deal basis the, for a whole host of reasons that I'm happy to get into. A fund is an imperfect vehicle for them. Um, but the functionally, it's the same for private equity, venture capital, real estate. It's really a choice of do you want to be a fund participant or deal by deal? And obviously, you could do both. But Typically, investors have a preference of one over the other. Got it. So how do you get into this space of raising capital? Because you were like a district attorney or something at one point, weren't you? Yeah. So I'm a recovering attorney, prosecutor by trade. I was at the Nashville Davidson County District Attorney's Office where I was on the vehicular trial team trying anything from an open container to a DUI to vehicular manslaughter. It's a great job, but the type of job that you have for five years or 50 years and just wasn't going to be a 50 year type of guy. To answer your question, the way I got into this, and I want to be very transparent and vulnerable about it is I'm married into a very affluent family. I have the benefit of enjoying extreme privilege of being a white guy that went to really good academic schools. So I got into capital raising because I was able to get a lot of meetings other people weren't able to get and just kind of embraced that sales mentality. And we can get into this later, but if you want to be in this business, it's very capital intensive, regardless if you're raising a fund or deal by deal, but commercial real estate, it's, it's, it takes a lot of money, right? And so you need to have somebody focused internally in your organization that's only focused on capital raising. Otherwise, it's going to be very challenging for you to scale your business. And a lot of people want to outsource their third party. And I think that's a mistake. And so I've embraced that function of investor relations, reporting, 
networking, capital raising, whatever kind of label you want to put on it, but it's ultimately sales. I'm asking people to give their resources, whether it's time or money in return for a product that I offer them, which is, you know, commercial real estate investment. Yeah. So <laughs> you're being transparent and vulnerable. I will be too. So I was sitting in the front of a mastermind in a hot seat and it's actually Dave Lindahl's mastermind. And he says, Jerome, what's the problem? I said, I don't want to raise capital. I just want to operate my deals. And he says, Jerome, if you don't raise capital, you're going to go out of business. And to your point, I mean, the fact of the matter is you need money coming in when money's going out in order to stay in business because it's a cash flow game and the cash flows are irregular because of the nature of the investment. And the thesis is if you can raise the value of the property, then you create real wealth. Um, and I, the more deals I look at, the more people I talk to, the more I realize it's not so much about the cash flow. A lot of people talk about the cash flow, but the real hits that you get are at refi and exit. And so for folks who are out there and like, I want to invest in real estate, I want to invest in real estate, and they think it's going to be like a paycheck from a job, they're pretty disappointed once they get into the space and actually see what's going on and how it works. Um, is your experience very different from that? No, I'd say that's pretty accurate, right? I mean, especially for, for me and my business, I work with accredited investors, right? Which means by definition, you're a rich person. Real estate is a really good, the type of real estate I do, which is passive income oriented, it's a really good way to maintain a quality of life and to have some extra cash flow. But in terms of wealth creation, the type of real estate that I do, it's going to be a challenge, right? We're not doing deep value add, we're not doing development, we're not doing opportunistic because I just, I don't have the risk for it personally. I don't have the risk profile for it. I don't have the stomach for it. And most of my investors are just trying to maintain a quality of life as opposed to achieve some higher level of it. And I'm very transparent about that in terms of the investors or the LPs that work with me and, and what the return profile expectations should be. And I think a lot of sponsors and GPs, to your point, I know it's challenging and hard because you want that capital to come in. You want to convert that investor but you will be much better off if you're just very transparent about what you think is achievable given your investment strategy and what is not. Yeah, that's, uh, transparency comes up a lot. And then some people throw around authenticity. I think authenticity may be overused in today's workforce because I don't know, man. I, I feel like it's one of the buzzwords and it, people aren't actually authentic. They pretend to be, and then when you actually get to spend some time with them, you see how much of a facade there actually is. And I think that becomes super challenging. So let's go back to the privilege thing. And why do you feel like you are able to get meetings that other people can't? Because that's a very strong statement. And you basically say it has nothing to do with me or very little to do with me. The majority of it is things that I didn't do to earn this right. And you're a pretty hard worker. I mean, I, I, I know your resume pretty well. There, there's no way you accomplish those things without being a hard worker. Yeah, I'm not saying I don't work hard and I think that's fine to talk about, but I also really strongly believe that, especially in the commercial real estate business, we, we have a duty to be honest and forthright about the privileges that we have as, as, as being, you know, white males that went to elite schools. And once you're in that network and once you're in that peer group, doors just kind of open, right? I think from my experience, when you walk into the room and you're a member of a certain club or you went to the right school or you married the right person, the assumption is you're smart, hardworking, know what you're doing, successful, I should listen to this person. Whereas I think some other people who don't look like me, the assumption is they have to earn that meeting. So it's, it's not the, right, but I think it's the way it is. So it's the benefit of the doubt is what you're getting at. You, you get the benefit of the doubt, whereas other people have to earn their way into the room. Yeah, I mean, 
it's why when people describe, and I will, maybe I'm going a little bit too out there, but I'm probably described as a good guy and a hard worker to a lot of people, right? Whereas when people describe you, they probably call you articulate. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know what it means and I know what it means, but it's this, it's those microaggressions and that those cliches that we throw around that I think don't ultimately help anybody. And I, I don't have the answer or the solutions, but I think it's a conversation we need to be having. Wow. So we've never had this conversation on the podcast. This is extremely interesting. And your level of awareness is, is just extremely high. So I, I deeply appreciate this. And so we'll, we'll try to keep treat this thing with some care, but I'm interested in having the conversation. So and you live in Nashville, which is, I don't think is very diverse in and of itself. And like you schooled in Boston at a liberal arts school. And so that means it was pretty expensive, which is a way that people filter out other folks. How do you, how do you see the world differently? Like when, when you look out onto the landscape and you see some of the things that are happening in the space, what do you, what do you think, and why not just be insulated and isolated from it versus using your voice to create opportunity? Because I th think, in the essence, the more that you speak on it, the more awareness you bring, and that awareness allows other people to question or catch themselves when they may be doing something that is inappropriate, that is acceptable in their world, though. Yeah, it's uncomfortable, right? Um, and I think part of it is as a population, as a culture in America, we don't even really have the vocabulary to have this type of conversation. That's how forward it is to a lot of people, but it takes practice. And the more that you have this conversation, the e not easier, but the more comfortable you'll be with the response. And, you know, unfortunately, it's my opinion that until we kind of, as a country, come to some kind of semblance of, of dealing with this original sin of, of slavery, it's going to be very difficult to have a functional society that truly is representative of the people that make up the population. And for me, when I look around and there's, there's a lot of bad things happening right now, it's a pretty small thing, but if you can elevate somebody's conversation, if you can elevate their struggle or their story or their narrative to your population, to your network, I think there's value in that. And it's a pretty straightforward thing for me to do. And hopefully it helps other people be more empathetic towards your story, your background. And I think empathy, if you practice it enough, I think can help come to some kind of resolution on some of these really deep seated issues that we're suffering from right now. Wow. So let me see if I can boil this down. You, you acknowledge privilege and you want to use your privilege to begin or help make raise awareness about issues that you see in the world to those who turn a blind eye to it or are just insulated from it because of their day-to-day -day interactions. And you, you see that as part of your duty and something that should be done. Yeah, I don't want to be celebrated for it. I don't want any kind of kudos, but again, you know, when <laughs> you and your background live such a different life than I have, it's, it's a challenge for us to have, if I didn't know you, if I didn't have a pre-call with you, if I hadn't gotten to know you over the last couple of months and hear your story, The experience that you had growing up was so different than, than what I had. We don't even know how to communicate with each other, probably. It's just very difficult. And so to the extent that you can have more conversations like this 
and encourage people to have conversations like this, it can only help. Because what I see is just a bunch of people that are yelling at each other and talking at each other. There's very little listening happening on either side. And that leads to dysfunction. It leads to a whole host of things that are not productive, right? I mean, productive is more people in this country creating wealth, more people increasing their quality of life, more people being able to afford a higher cost of, of living. It's better for everybody, in my opinion. And it, it just doesn't seem like a lot of people are willing to engage in those conversations right now, especially in the commercial real estate space, which is so dominated by white males who are between 35 and 55. That's just a fact. Well, I mean, why would you break down or create new opportunities in an environment that I guess you reign supreme? Like, it, why would you tear down the castle? That doesn't seem to make sense in a lot of ways. Right, so people who have privilege and resources sometimes feel like they should build a moat around those privileges and resources because ultimately they're acting out of position of fear. And I think fear can be a really powerful motivator in the short term, but I think long term being motivated by fear does not make you a better person. And I think if you can be Again, I'm going to use this term a lot, but if you can be more empathetic and outward facing, I think long term your life will improve. But acting out of a place of fear, um, I don't think is a long term solution for anybody. It creates mistrust. Yeah. So, Let's go back to the career, like being a prosecutor, it's not, you know, top notch defense law where you're getting made, making piles and piles of money, but you still get paid fairly well. Why would you leave like the security of that type of career behind to go build your own thing? Cause I mean, that's, uh, and I mean, not just build your own thing, but build your own thing in a different industry. Yeah. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had gotten burned out on being a district attorney. And, and part of it was I saw this dysfunctioning of, of the government, frankly. Um, I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories that would probably be its own podcast. And I only did it for four or five years, right? I'm not a career prosecutor, but I certainly saw some things and I saw this semi-privatized industry state that had very little, I mean, most of the incentives around that criminal justice system were about incarcerating 25 to 45 year old black males for minor crimes for the most part. And then after 9-11 with Department of Homeland Security, I remember one day I was, I was processing no driver's license cases. It's a C misdemeanor in Tennessee, uh, which is the lowest level of, of criminal activity that is under the criminal code itself. And for the most part, they were, you know, people from Latin America, South America, Central America. And I remember asking one of the sheriff's deputies, where do they go after they, you know, get prosecuted or, you know, cop a plea bargain to, to a C misdemeanor, what, what happens? If they're illegal immigrant, they get imported through ICE, right? So they go from Nashville to New Orleans, and then they go from New Orleans to Honduras or wherever they're from. It takes six to nine months. And at the time, it cost around $60,000, soups and nuts, to process that individual. And I, as a district attorney, was getting paid roughly $55,000 a year. And I remember looking down at my docket and I had probably 200 no driver's license cases that day. 
And I just thought there's got to be a better way to handle this problem. I don't think I can make any of these changes as part of the system. And that's when I started looking around for other opportunities. Um, that was part of the story for sure. So you're supposed to be the guy doing good, but you didn't feel like you were the good do-gooder. You feel like you were taking advantage of people who probably weren't in a great position to begin with, huh? I felt like I was part of a machine that I didn't appreciate the role I played in it, right? Um, were there some evil people out there that I was trying to help protect from others? Sure. Is it one of the few jobs that you can have where at the end of the day, you go home, you think, I just try to do the right thing all day, every day. And, and you know, I can sleep well at night, 100%. But there were some real systemic issues involved. Um, where frankly, it just, it didn't seem like we were trying to solve any problems. Um, it seemed like we were trying to just keep the status quo. And again, um, if it weren't for 25 to 45 year old black males committing drug crimes, I would have been out of a job. Wow. So I thought there's, there's gotta be a better way to do this. Um, and we're kind of getting way far afield here, but you know, when you see what's happening in Florida, when, you know, convicted felons couldn't vote, then they overturned that so that they have the right to vote now. That's probably around 350,000 people, majority black male. And now when you see that they're not allowed to vote if they have outstanding court fees or um, penalties, court costs, um, I can tell you from personal experience that if you and I were to go down to the county clerk's office, the criminal court clerk's office here in Nashville, Davidson County, and I looked like I did and I wore a suit and tie and I rolled in there and I said, hey, I wanna pay all my court costs and fees and fines, I'd probably get taken care of in an hour, two hours. I think it'd be very difficult for you to get that done quickly. And even figuring out what you, if, you're a if you have multiple convictions in multiple counties, forget about it. Some rural counties, maybe it's a very challenging. Um, and I just don't think that's right. I mean, if anything, people have served in prison and I'm not forgiving the crimes that they committed, but they probably understand the federal government better than most people. I think they should certainly have a voice in their representation in government. Without question. And I mean, they, they paid the penalty that was given to them by the judge and the jury or the judge, depending on what the situation was. So, you know, they should be able to come back if they've been rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you got this conviction and you started making a change. Who showed up to help you out along the way? Transitioning out of the DA's office? Yeah, and into your own firm. Yeah, my father-in-law, um, who's the patriarch of our family uh, and the family office was a huge part of that story. Um, and I had a great network in Nashville of people who wanted to help, you know, who had supported entrepreneurs in the past, who had, you know, seen the stories end really well. Um, and it is a great community here, people who are supportive of local groups and um, aspiring entrepreneurs. And we have a great ecosystem here to help each other. So I couldn't begin to tell you, but um, some networking organizations I was a member of when I was you know, younger were certainly super helpful. And I think having mentors and role models, some of who had success and some of who did not have success and had blown up, very powerful to hear their journey and their stories and having somebody that had gone on that journey 
um, like the hero's journey, the three chapters, you know, the adventure, the excitement, the success, the inevitable failure and setbacks, and then ultimately the redemption. Having those people in your world makes all the difference in the world. This is wonderful. Awesome. And so, oh man, you get into this thing. I imagine that it was perfect the whole way and it's just a happily ever after, right? There's no issues or no challenges along the way that made you think, hey, what am I doing? That's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, did a couple of deals, margaritas on the beach, call it a day, you know, write a couple of emails and no, I mean, you know. What's up, tribe? It's your host, Jerome. I just want to let you know that we put together a free 15-point checklist for exiting the matrix. Jump on over to dreamshouldbereal.com in order to pick your free copy up. Let's get back to the show. And I think this is part of this conversation of, you know, I want to help other people and I want to help other people get into this business because it's a great business and it's wonderful. And there's a lot of opportunity. And if you, if real estate, such a low barrier to entry business, it's kind of the wild west, <laughs> but it's kind of fun, right? You get to meet a lot of people. And if you have the right attitude towards it, you can have a cool journey, which is kind of what we're here for, I think. But um, you've also got to realize that there, there's, there's risk there and I don't think it's very helpful for other people to come on to these type of shows and just talk about how great they are. I don't think that ultimately helps other people. Stories of success are important, but I think being vulnerable about the mistakes you've made and the setbacks you've had are more powerful. Because if you can prevent somebody from stepping in that same pothole twice, you've lessened their learning curve, which means that their ability to get there faster is increased, which is what we're all about or should be about, in my opinion. It's what I'm about. And so for me, we have a whole episode about the mistakes I've made, but the big one is you have to realize that you are a small business owner when you're in this business and that the real estate deals have to work, but there's all this other stuff associated with your business investor relations, reporting, communication, business development, tax, audit, bookkeeping, HR. Those things really have nothing to do with real estate directly, but I think they're even more important than the deals themselves. And I think oftentimes people don't appreciate that they're taking a dual risk there on the deals and being a small business owner. And that's why I think it's very hard to be a fund manager when you're young, because running a fund and operating a fund has its own set of challenges that again, obviously related to the, to the investments you're making, but not really directly. Man, this is solid, man. I love what's happening here. So, all right, you, you had the challenges. When did you realize you had to keep going? Like, why not just turn around and go back and tuck the tail? Yeah, so I had a very difficult period where everything kind of came to a head at once. And there was, there was a lot of negativity because we had not put the resources that we should have towards some of those things that I talked about because we were deal guys. I spent some time talking to some people that I really respected, including some mentors and peers. And you will not undergo personal growth until you go through a period of time where you just get your teeth kicked in. And there's a reason when you go on Shark Tank or you talk to venture capital people, or you talk to entrepreneurs, or you listen to these books about serial entrepreneurs, I mean, the scar tissue is real. And unless you go through those periods of time and you embrace that, that period of darkness and you really live it and you, ex and you internalize it and you kind of taste the blood in your mouth, you're not going to grow 
ultimately. And I think I am a much better manager and business owner and real estate person now because of that episode than I would have been even if I had experienced tremendous success. And so it's very difficult for me to say, oh yeah, if you're going through a hard period, just live with it. It's not easy advice to follow. But when things go sideways, keep that perspective of, well, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Because hearing about it from somebody like me and experiencing it are two different things. Two totally different things. And people feel like they know because they heard the story about it. But when that pit, like you feel your stomach drop and you, you get the question like, what am I going to do now? Or how can I fix this? Or a number of other questions that get asked along the way. Totally different experience. Yeah. And that's where this business is not for everybody. I mean, it, you know, you live and breathe by these deals. You're going at risk. You're putting a ton of work and time into these things. And the benefits can be tremendous and the rewards can be great. But it's not for the faint of heart. You know, there's a reason that, and this is kind of the beautiful thing about America. The statistics every year are, you know, X amount of businesses are launched and X amount of businesses fail. But in, in our culture, in our society, we don't forgive those failures, but we do give the second chances. And we give the people kind of the opportunity to come back. You see that in our bankruptcy laws, you see that in our popular culture. And I think that's very powerful. So that's interesting because I think that probably circles back to this point of benefit of the doubt. I think I've heard a lot of people throughout my career say, Jerome, you're only going to get one shot, right? Don't, don't mess it up. You got the shot, don't mess it up. And if I take it back to sports, it's the same thing, right? Like you're on the field, don't let somebody else get, get your spot. Cause if you do, now you're out of the driver's seat, you're at the mercy of somebody else messing up or somebody giving you another chance. So what's been your worst fear in this entire process and how'd you break through it? Um, my biggest fear is that my, my dad won't be proud of me. That's heavy. So I, I still seek that affirmation. And he's given it to me. It's not like he's, he's a very nice person. He's not a cruel man. He's a good man. He's a great man. But when you talk about motivation, you know, I think this is the other side of the coin that I think for some people who grew up differently than I did, it's very hard for them to empathize with and appreciate when you're surrounded by a peer group and a network of ultra high achievers who are super successful Keeping up with the Joneses is a real thing, right? And you will feel pressure to do certain things because when you go to XYZ cocktail party or event, you hear about, you know, liquidity events and successful exits and second houses. And that's real. And maybe it is a 1% problem, but it's still a problem. And I, and I think some people don't acknowledge how much they're driven by that. Well, I, I think that is common, but I, across all socioeconomic statuses, it's just what do the Joneses have, right? I can go, if I, if I go to the lower end of the spectrum, it can be that TV or it can be that necklace or it can be rims on your car or it can be the sound system or it can be the car, or it could be the boat, or it could be the vacation. Like you can keep going up. The thing that I, I, I struggle with a little bit here, but I, I think it's just the way that people think about the world. 
is keeping up with the Joneses when it comes to assets and things that accumulate or build wealth is very different from things that are consumer goods that do nothing but go down in value while you have it. Yeah. And, and that, that's, that's, that's the false premise of status, right? Some of these things in some cultures imply a status, but they're ultimately short-lived depreciating assets. That is scary. I, I haven't had this conversation before. This is phenomenal. But if you think about it, if your average life expectancy is like, you know, until you're 35, or if, you know, if you don't have a network of people who are in their 50s and doing well, that you can aspire to, how would you know? Yeah. No examples, no role models. This is, this is deep. Brian, was there a point when everything was on the line? Did you hit a rock bottom? I had a challenge period of my life. Um, but my rock bottom, you know, <laughs> I've got cushion. Um, but it certainly felt like that to me, that there was a period where I thought the hero's journey was going to end in chapter two, <laughs> for sure. Um, it was probably internalized and probably lacked perspective, but sometimes when you're in your own head, it can, it can feel pretty real. Yeah, I mean, for me, I remember realizing like, I can't even go qualify for, to live in one of the apartment buildings that we own. And if it wasn't for my lady, I, I could be sleeping under a bridge or in a car because I can't go rent a place, I can't go get a mortgage because I was in the transition space and nobody was going to lend to me in a real way outside of commercial stuff. And so that for me was terrifying because ever since I left home, I was pretty much able to do whatever I needed to do. And then I had to start relying on other people. And that part is not being self-sufficient is terrifying. Yeah, I remember I was in law school. Um, I graduated in 09. It's just a brutal time to graduate law school. And I had my, um, I had a job offer at the DA's office. They pulled it because there was a budget freeze and they were a hiring freeze. And 2009, I've got 150 grand of law school debt, just married. And I applied to be a barista at a coffee shop locally and I remember I got rejected because I didn't have enough experience. And, um, you know, that was a challenge. And I, it was more, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't nearly a situation like you. I, I had a lot of resources available to me. It was that pride issue, right? That, you know, I'm supposed to be this person. And it was very difficult for me to come to terms with that. But I, I've, I've sensed, and I think this is maybe part of this journey that we're all going on and that going through those difficult periods, I've since tried to learn about that mindset. And I had a friend tell me this and I thought it was just one of the smartest things I've heard in my life. And if you're not on watching the video, but if you, <laughs> If you take your two, your thumb and your index finger and kind of put them apart like an inch and you say to yourself, okay, well, suffering occurs in the space between my true reality and where I perceive my reality should be, suffering occurs in that in-between space. So to the extent that you can lessen that gap, the less suffering you'll have in your life. 
So you have to accept things as they are and then do something to change them is kind of my takeaway from that. Yeah. I mean, just because you think you deserve a beach house doesn't mean you're going to get a beach house. And if that's not your true reality, I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about it because ultimately it just leads to more suffering and you can change your base reality through work and and risk-taking and fortune and whatever you can assign that to. But it is what it is. It's very Buddhist. I love. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's very Eastern thought process. But I, it's been helpful to me. It's not for everybody, but yeah, I, I realized last week like some people just want to sit in the suffering. They want to they want to feel it. They want to be wrong. They want to be a victim, and. Eventually, they got to come out of it, but trying to move them out of it before they're ready is a fool's errand because it's not going to work. They're not ready. You can't make them. They're, they're just going to go back in. It's kind of like taking a dog outside in the rain to go to the bathroom. They're going to come back in. <laughs> um, yeah. So, man, there's so many other places I want to go. We're going to have to come. We're going to have to bring you back, man. Um what are you most grateful for? I'm really grateful that my parents spent time and resources to make me an intellectually curious person and to have lived a very safe childhood with every opportunity in the world. Because those decisions about how they allocated their resources, and you can put however many zeros you want, but ultimately it's a function of kind of how they allocated their resources. Most of those energies were spent on me and my brother to afford us every opportunity. And, you know, my ability to go to a great, K through 12 school, to go to an incredibly good college, to be afforded those opportunities and to have that intellectual curiosity instilled in me early. Um, you can't make up for that later in life. Just start matters, absolutely matters as far as being able to get traction and then make progress. Would you That's right. focus on catching next? What's next on the agenda for me? Yeah, what dream are you most focused on catching next? <laughs> Man, it's a great question. You know, I love my job. I live a great life. Um, I think COVID has taught me that I've probably got a bigger network than I realize because I can do things like this, which I was scared to do before. Um the next adventure for me is making sure that my kids aren't total jerks. It's going to be work. It's going to take, you know, 10, 15 years of work and it'll be a fun journey, but it's a journey. Um, that's kind of, you know, Deepak Chopra talks about phases of life. Like when you're one to 25, you're learning and experiencing when you're 25 to 50, you're, you know, you're, you're gaining your fortune. Right. 50 to 75, you're giving it back. 75 to 100, you're coming to terms with death. Your death. Dealing with that existential anxiety. So I'm in that 25 to 50 range where, you know, I have the ability to do some, I think, some really interesting things and learn from some really interesting people. Um, So that's next. I mean, there, there is no destination here for us. I don't think it's the whole journey because once you, you know, one of the saddest times of my life was I had, I had all these milestones, right? When I make X amount of money, when I have this amount of AUM and once you assign value to those milestones and those signposts, it's been my experience 
and maybe not for everybody, but once you hit them, it's some of the most depressing episodes I've had in my life because you realize nothing actually fundamentally changed. Nothing at all. And once you, and I try to think through things as I'm a sack of meat, I am worm food that happens to have the ability to experiencing things. And at some point I will go back to my natural state of being worm food. Very stoic. But along the way, if I can help other people, if I can experience interesting things, if I can learn new things, I will have lived a interesting dynamic life, rich with educational opportunities. And, and I think that's the next journey for me is, you know, having more conversations like this. That's something that I can look forward to every day. I appreciate you saying that. I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm gonna ask anyway. What gift are you giving the world? It's a heavy question, man. You didn't give me that in the pre-call. <laughs> what gift am I giving the world? Um, you know, I think the ability to not be scared of, of being open and vulnerable and to shed this facade of sometimes hero culture that we have. I think there's a generation of people who, you know, I'm 38, a generation of us who don't have the vocabulary and we don't have the toolkit to talk about our feelings and emotions and our, and our fears and our wants. I think helping people, you know, live a more balanced life where they're not always afraid, that could be pretty powerful because that could have a, a big chain reaction. But it's a conversation not many people want to have. They don't want to have it because they're scared what people are going to think. They're scared of what it may impact or, and it may get rid of the benefit of the doubt. And so what I thought you were gonna say in response to that question was empathy, because that's kind of been the overarching theme of your message to me today is just, how can we be more human and how can we help other humans regardless of the wrapping paper, but just really get down to the core and their essence and then figure out how to serve them in a way that allows them to go out and do their best work. I mean, that that's my takeaway from you. And that's what I'm grateful for you being here and doing that work, whether I benefit from it personally or not. Uh, I think it's just a great opportunity for people to have exposure to you and in, in this message. And I think it will give other people the opportunity to be courageous in it because I don't see how the world gets any better by other people helping other people. It just, it baffles me. And you also label the people who are building moats around their thing and saying, hey, that's fear culture, right? You opening a door for somebody else doesn't close a door for you. In fact, it probably opens up other doors because that person is gonna do what they can to pay it forward. So, you know, Brian, Super grateful that you're so generous with your time today. And you were op open and had a transparent conversation with me about some really tough uh, issues going on in our, our world and a good place. And I appreciate you being willing to use your voice, your privilege, your platform to share this message. And again, just the lead from the front versus just kind of sitting back and watching and participating and continuing to perpetuate the system that as you saw from with your own eyes front lines might not be as fair or working for everybody um, and so the final question that I, I like to ask the guests is 
what is the one thing you want folks to take away from our conversation today? Don't be afraid to put yourself out there a little bit more and get outside of your comfort zone because I think the reward is worth that risk. And, and I'm actually doing this through Wesleyan, which is where I went to college, which totally shifted my worldview. And, and I met my wife there, my brother went there. It was an incredible experience on multiple levels, but you know, I'm hosting a, uh, like a podcast series for student athletes to help them we don't call it networking, but it's relationship building because a lot of people just don't have that skill set. Skill set don't understand how that works, and so I, I think it's not a zero sum game. And if you, the more you give, the more you will get back. And I would just encourage people to have, you know, an abundant mindset of, of giving, because it doesn't necessarily have to do with money. You can give your time. You can give your expertise and it can really make a huge impact. Um, so I'd encourage people to do that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Brian, thank you again for joining me on the Dreamcatchers podcast. I look forward to continuing to build our relationship and make positive impact on each other's lives. We'll talk soon, man. Thank you for joining the tribe today. We would love to hear from you. Please don't forget to rate, like, and share. Perhaps someone you know could benefit from what we've discussed. Until the next time, remember that your dreams should be real.